Well, I'm happy to introduce our speakers today, Dr. Bradford. Now, weren't you one of our presidents at one time? His pictures up here. Right, before children. Okay. <laughs> Twin girls. <laughs> so we're happy to have him back as a speaker now. And he was a Maverick volunteer from 1967 to 74 from the Navy Reserves. Stationed at Naval Hospital in Memphis, 3rd Marine, and Sea Base in, in Gulfport. He went to EM residency in Louisville General Hospital and first residency trained ER physician in Mississippi. So a bunch of firsts. Louisville. Louisville. Well, that was Louisville. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Not Louisville, but Louisville. <laughs> See, I had a church in Louisville, so I get that mixed up. Go. Excuse me. Louisville. That's up north. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and he was looking after an ER where he could never turn anyone away because of the inability to pay or immigration status and worked 41 years in ER and urgent care. If you've seen the show, what's that show we like, Christine? New Amsterdam. New Amsterdam on TV. That was sort of what Bill was pi pioneering, that, that kind of uh, a treat everybody kind of policy. And Mary Harris was uh, worked as <clears throat> in the U.S. Naval Reserve June 1973, the summer before her senior college at Avila? Avila. Avila College in Kansas City, Missouri. Major was in nursing and she was commissioned November 6th in November, six months prior, I'm sorry, read it wrong, to graduating with a BS in nursing. And she attended officer's training in Newport, Rhode Island, was stationed in Charleston, South Carolina, where she worked with a rotation of specialties to develop a wide range of clinical experiences. She was given an honorable discharge in February 1978. Anybody guess why? Oh, baby. 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 <laughs> Her husband, a Navy lieutenant, so you're all in the military family. Moved to Bay St. Louis, March 1978, where he was stationed at the Naval Research Lab in Bay St. Louis and began work in 1979 at the local hospital where she worked almost continuously until she retired in 2013. During her tenure, she spent most of her time in the emergency department where she was a manager from 1996 until retired. In 2003, she graduated with her master's from South Alabama as a family nurse practitioner. So you kept going to school, huh? Kept going to school. Talk to my wife about me keep going to school. <laughs> We're in the same boat. Well, I'm, I'm happy to present these speakers to you and come on up here. Thank you. Sneak in behind. I think that'll be fine. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. And uh, we'll get our slide presentation going in a second. Here we go. So um, I'm going to start off with a little generalities of, of hospital preparedness. Hospitals with the guidance of Joint Commission saw the need for disaster preparedness. Thus, hospitals for the past 30 years have developed policies and procedures to prepare for multiple disasters that would impact hospitals and patients. In our region, hurricane preparedness is considered a priority. It's a time to review your departmental staffing requirements and needs concerning possible needs with outages such as utilities, water, computers, etc. So when I first moved to Bay St. Louis, my neighbors had a timeline they used to talk about with Hurricane Camille, kind of like in the middle. Thus everything either before or after Hurricane Camille just kind of was their, was their mark in the sand. And it, that's kind of the first idea I had about hurricanes and the, and the devastation they could cause. Hancock Medical Center conducted drills through the years and refined a lockdown policy when you had, where you had two teams, one that locked down for the hurricane and the second team that would provide relief. As the manager, I was on the lockdown team and responsible for having all the uh, staff assigned to a team. 
Katrina was no different. I had been locked down for many a hurricane. Mostly it was light duty though. On, for Katrina, I happened to be in Starkville several days before Katrina. My daughter had been sick and I was helping her with the recovery. And my sister, who happens to be here with me, calls and says, are you coming to Kansas City? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, there's a hurricane taking up the entire Gulf. You know, you need to evacuate and come here. Well, I said, you know, that's not how it works, Jane. You know, I'm committed to the hospital. And so I check in with the director of nursing. And, you know, when I left, it was headed for Florida, which was, as you all know, a common thing where, you know, the head of, the, you know they have it tracked one direction and then all of a sudden it kind of veers away or starts heading towards you. So um, I wasn't really very worried, neither was the hospital, but they said they're getting prepared just in case. And um, I said, well, I'll, I'll be back if I need to be. And they said, okay. So on Sunday the 28th, you know, it appeared that Hancock Medical Center would be impacted and the final preparations were being made and they said, you need to get back now. So I'm like, okay. So I leave Starkville, you know, about nine o'clock in the morning, and I was the only car traveling south on Highway 49. In fact, the highway patrolled me, stopped me and said, um, you need to turn around now. I said, no, no, I have, to go, I have to go to the Mississippi Gulf Coast because I work in a hospital. And he said, they've evacuated all the hospitals. And I go, no, they haven't evacuated Hancock. We're committed to being there for our population if needed. And he said, well, you know, they're gonna switch the lane soon. I better hurry because Miramar Nursing Home and Past Christiane had just been ordered to be evacuated by the governor. So I'm like, okay, I'm headed. So the hospital had a metal roof and that was our biggest concern always that roof damage would happen with the storm. And so we had all the patients on the first floor. So at approximately 10 o'clock, Katrina struck the Mississippi Gulf Coast with winds of about 120 miles an hour and a storm surge that was estimated to be about 30 feet. After the eye passed over the emergency department, we were feeling pretty good. There was no loss of power that we saw, no broken windows in the department. I was actually talking to my husband on the phone who had gone to the test site for the evacuation on the landline, and uh, we were feeling pretty good about things in the emergency department. Then all of a sudden, the landline went dead. And I'm like, hmm. And Dr. Appleyard, who was our medical director, was standing um, looking outside the department, and of course, we had boards up on all the windows and everything and doors. And um, he said, you know, um, this, is not, this is not a good thing. <laughs> you know, I said, I said what? He said, um, you know, the hospital tries to discharge all the patients, and there were about nine of them remaining in the hospital. You know, the, the county does have special needs shelters that for those patients requiring oxygen and other needs, and the school nurses would staff those centers, um, which could be, you know, very emotionally and, and, um, and physically demanding duty. But, um, you know, when Dr. Appleyard said he didn't feel it very good about things, we were just kind of monitoring things. And then he saw the rising water in the drainage ditch outside of the EDAR, ED and instructed me to have the patients transferred to the second floor. Now, Dr. Appleyard is the head of the emergency department. He was kind of the medical director. So he was in charge of patient care and, um, and taking the measures that he thought was needed for patient safety. And he said he had a bad feeling about the situation. So I proceeded down to the medical floor and talked to the nursing manager down there. And uh, you know, I said, you know, Dr. Appleyard's concerned and he thought, you know, she thought we were being overly cautious, but you know, was willing to, you know, follow the, start the process and do what he need, do what needed to be done. So she said, well, you need to go talk to the administrator and tell him. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go down and tell him. So I, you know, I wandered down there and said, Dr. Appleyard doesn't have a good feeling. He goes, oh, Mary, it's not gonna be that bad. There's water coming up, but it will be okay. I said, well, the, it's all in motion, so we're moving everybody up. So I returned to the emergency department, and the water now is coming under the doors of the emergency room entrance. So I said, okay, so we're kind of monitoring everything. And uh, after about, you know, 10, 15 minutes, you know, he said, okay, go check on everything. And uh, so I go down to the floor, and they're just getting the last patient off the elevator, and all of a sudden the elevator goes dead. And so we start saying, okay, um, you know, it's time to evacuate all staff members to the second floor. So um, by the time I got back to the emergency room, the water's now up to my knees. Of course, I'm pretty short, but it's like, oh my goodness. 
So Dr. Appleyard said, well, where's the food and the water? I right, played, it's in the kitchen. And he goes, so I, he said, go, go, go be prepared because this, this may not turn out well. So I said, okay. So I took several staff men members down to the kitchen. I said, you know, the water's coming in fast. We need to move. So we took the food and the water um, to the second floor by the steps. We, you know, by this time I'm holding it over my head, watching the fish swim by one of the windows outside that we had floor to ceiling windows along one of the hallways. And uh, there are all these fish and we're looking at each other going, this is unbelievable. And so we're carrying the stuff over our heads up the steps. And uh, it was quite an amazing sight actually. So on the second floor, the hospital staff look out over the parking lots and watch the sea of water rising. By now, I'd say it'd been about 45 minutes, and uh, every car in the parking lot was going underwater. You know, I'm looking at my brand new Honda, just come a boat. I'm like, oh my goodness. So as quickly as the water came up, it went down. I don't know how many people were here, but my neighbors tell me the same thing that it came up in about 45 minutes and went down in about 45 minutes. So as we're looking at this, the administrator says to me, and we're having a meeting downstairs with all the department managers, you know, it's bad, just go down and secure the emergency room, close everything up. I'm like, okay. So we, we're, uh, we're returning um, and discovering the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. So these are some photos that my sister took about two days after the storm when she walked through and I told her it was a mess. <laughs> so there's about four fi pictures that she had taken. Um, one of them's in, a couple of them are in the emergency room and one of them is the lab and then there's another one of the post-op area. Yeah, I'll just show the pictures. And this is, that's actually a recovery. That's one of the emergency rooms that we had. So the generator was out of service, although it was elevated, and the, actually the um, maintenance crew worked nonstop. In about 12 hours, they got it up functioning again. But we were without power for at least that long. All the supplies were wet on the first floor. Everything was displaced. Everything was non-operational. And we thought we had pretty, had pretty good policies in place for a hurricane or disaster, but we quickly figured out that we really hadn't done that good of a job. That, um, you know, we had these cheap flashlights and the batteries were already going out, and, you know, looking for paper to ride on. And, um, and I'm securing the department though. And much to our surprise, when we got down to the emergency room, there must be at least 50 people outside the door. Of course, we're thinking most people in Hancock County had evacuated, but that we quickly re realized that was not the case. And all these people were scared. They needed assistance. They needed tre treatment. The post-surgical and the pediatric patients were on the second floor in that tower that, that we still have to this day, and the pharmacy was on the third floor. So we did have some limited equipment that we could bring down, but of course, until the generators were back up, it was, it was not, not very valuable. So for nurses who are used to working with IV pumps and all sorts of machines, you quickly realize that you needed to revert back to basic skills. So, uh, so much for closing the emergency department. So we just, you know, threw off, you know, wet linen and started seeing patients. So um, we used paper, paper and pencil and got the minimal amount of information for each patient. And uh, with that, you know, we, at first we were getting social security numbers and all sorts of information. <laughs> and, you know, we're looking at each other going, this is worthless, you know, insurance information. Street and treat, you know, back in the old days. So, but the hospital was very fortunate. We had a general surgeon, anesthesia, four emergency department physicians in-house to assist with all the injuries. The worst of our patients included two near drowning victims, two patients with severe burn injuries from a gas line explosion, and a man with an arterial bleed who had punched his fist through the attic window to get his kids and family out. So I saw Dr. Anthony work on him, you know, under with four or five flashlights being being used on the stretcher in the ER using the best sterile equipment we could find. Most patients needed tetanus shots, sutures from lacerations, medications they had lost, respiratory difficulties, so you were giving them oxygen and updrafts. 
seemed like a never ending stream of patient, patients with trauma, with cuts, falls, anxiety, pain, you name it, they had it. And of course, an endless supply of chain saw injuries as time went on. You know, like I said, we thought we were prepared for the, in the emergency room, but quickly realized that Katrina had dealt us a serious blow. You know, the, the highway patrol and the police are coming in and they're saying, the bridge is out, the cell towers are down, the only place you can get cell service is where the bridge used to be. And, you know, that night was actually very eerie. There was a sense of calm with muggy temperatures and no mosquitoes. And, you know, it's like, I said, where are the bugs? They said, Mary, they're all in Hattiesburg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, um, you know, you can become very resourceful, you know. Like I said, there's a large drainage ditch, you know, outside of the emergency department, and they put up all sorts of um, uh, tent coverings, et cetera, to make latrines. You know, it was, it, it, uh, it was one of those things you learned, learned to be resourceful. On Tuesday, the next day, it was kind of strange. The first person I encountered was a man from Florida. He said, uh, who's in charge? I said, well, I mean, I'm sort of in charge. What can I do for you, sir? How did you get here? And he said, I'm looking for my mother. I came from Nor Naples, Florida. I said, we were told nobody could get here. And he's like, oh, I got here. And I said, okay. So where was your mother? She was at Miramar Hurt Nursing Home, and I heard there's no nursing home. And I said, I can't guarantee it, but judging from what the, uh, the State Highway Patrol says, I'd, I'd say that's true. But I did hear yesterday that Miramar was evacuated to Hattiesburg. He said, are you sure? I said, I heard it from the, from the State Highway Patrol when I was drown, driving down, so I think that's pretty accurate. And so he said, I said, well, when did you leave? And he said, as soon as um, Hurricane Katrina was hitting New Orleans, I was in the car and I was headed this direction. And he said, I, uh, I went down the interstate to 10 until I had to get off, and then I went behind the test site and got in through the back door there. There was no guards. And then I got on 607 and drove through there. And I said, well, they said there's trees everywhere. And he says, I have a chainsaw in my car. I said, okay. His mother was 90. This guy was in his, in his early 60s, I'd say. So anyway, but he didn't stay long. I gave him, a, I gave him a, a bottle of water, and he was on his way to Hattiesburg. So um, then later, we were excited when we saw a helicopter was landing on the landing pad out in front of the hospital. So we go out there to meet him, and he goes, well, I came to bring you a patient from New Orleans. It's a diabetic patient. And I go, a diabetic patient? Are they stable? Well, yes, ma'am. I go, well, we have two burn patients who are critical, and they need to go to the burn center in Mobile if they're going to live. Oh. I said, I tell you what, you give me your diabetic, I'll give you one of my burns. He goes, ma'am, that's not the way this works. I go, well, this, 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 this guy's going to die if we don't do something. He goes, okay, okay. So we traded patients, and I made him promise to come back for his wife. And he comes back, and uh, I kept the diabetic, and he, uh, he says, I got in a lot of trouble because of you. And I go, well, just look at the bright side. You saved two lives. But uh, it was that kind of thing. And it remind, I never could quite understand it until you read about the aftermath of Katrina stories, and most of them are how bad things were in New Orleans. They don't say too much about the Mississippi Gulf Coast when you read the articles. So, um, so the, the, the department, though, they did try to go out and help people, the emergency room physician and the nurse practitioner. They were going to the senior citizen to treat people with respiratory complaints. They were handing out oxygen. They were going to give tetanus stop shots. We were trying to do everything we could to help the population of Hancock County. And we were transferring the inpatients we had, which were, like I said, about nine of them, and we were trying to network with other. We're, we were a, a hospital corporation of America Hospitals, so you know they were networking with other such hospitals to get our patients out. Um, but, you know, we were quickly running out of medications as well, so the ER physician um, and some of the staff and the police went to nearby pharmacies to kind of reallocate goods that were needed. So this, these are some more pictures that were just taken right after the storm to kind of give you an idea, if anybody wasn't here for Katrina, how things looked. Twisted trees, no, no bridge, lost as asphalt. So on Wednesday, um, we get the staff were, you know, the lockdown uh, relief staff was starting to show up. Things were getting a little 
more settled, although we were still seeing it on just patients nonstop. And a lot of it was giving moral support to people as well. You know, it's tough when you've lost everything. So on Thursday, the National Guard from Missouri showed up. And uh, so they, they, uh, they arrive and the, the um, I can't remember uh, what his rank was, but I think that he was a major or, uh, and he comes and said, I'm here to relieve you. And I said, music to my ears. <laughs> so um, he uh, said, you know, I said, you need any help? Because many of the staff had lost everything. You know, they'd lost their homes and they really didn't have any place to go. We were shutting down the hospital. And so um, they, they really didn't have a job at that exact moment. So they were willing to volunteer and help. And so were several of the doctors until they figured things out. And he goes, no, no, we got this. And I said, okay, that's good. So about, maybe about two hours later, after the steady stream of people were filling up their tents, he goes, I think I've changed my mind. <laughs> we could use a little bit more help than what we thought. But we were very grateful for the, the National Guard showing up. And during, while we were living it, it seemed like forever for somebody to come and help. But when you look back on it, you know, they were here very quickly. You know, by the time the storm was over, set up tents. Um, Dr. Bradford and I were just talking. The team from North Carolina showed up as well, and they'd gone to New Orleans to offer their services. That's where they were assigned, and the mayor told them that they weren't needed. So they came back to Waveland, and of course Waveland in Hancock County looked at them with open arms because it was much bigger than the Missouri unit. They had um, labor and delivery capabilities and operating rooms, so it was a nice addition for our county to have that. And. Um, You know, it was, a, it was a very good thing. Well, my time is up, and I think I ran over. I'm sorry, Dr. No, Bradford. No, 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 so no problem. Thank, thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them after. I'm Bill Bradford, anyway. I grew up in Waveland. Anyway, I've seen two uh, storms as far as Camille and you know, Katrina, but anyway, I was there before, doing, and after. I was in the medical corps. Anyway, uh, my uniform was destroyed with Katrina, but with the medical corps, anyway, it was an acorn, and it had a nut on it. I don't know what the dental corps was. In other words, if you had a nut on the acorn, that meant in the medical corps. Anyway, uh, we try to heal frequently, cure sometimes, and comfort always. I'll start off when I was eight years of age. My mother had a fainting episode, collapsed, had a, you know, a concussion. She would ask questions every three minutes, the same question. Anyway, I had to go. My father had had chest pains and he was a cardiac individual. I had to go to the uh, grocery store and call. This was uh, the hearse came and picked up my mother. So anyway, this is the evolution of what's going on in emergency care. Anyway, uh, my mother and father were both admitted to the uh, hospital on Carroll Avenue. Uh, anyway, uh, I had to call my aunt and say, I, I feel like an orphan. Can I come stay, you know, with you until my mother and father get out of the hospital? But anyway, uh, in 1965, I was working for the water and gas here in Waveland. Anyway, the ditch, uh, uh, ditch digger broke and I needed to work so I went to the hospital and said that I'd be glad to you know work there uh, with no pay anyway uh, they told me yes we'll be glad to take you and we'll pay you anyway this was in the days of you know oxygen tents I don't know uh, if you can remember the way that used to be that you could not even see the patient Anyway, uh, with the oxygen tent, as far as the humidity, uh, anyway, I learned very quickly two members, uh, you know, that I knew died, and we found that sometimes we could just hold the hands of someone who is passing, 
you know, to their creator. I'm going to talk in terms of being a reflection on the grunt doctor. Anyway, I volunteered, you know, uh, for the military in uh, 1967 for the U.S. Navy Reserves. And that was after my uh, classmate was killed in Vietnam. I went to Loyola and Rod Rod, he was our ROTC commander anyway, he went to Vietnam and he was killed less than six weeks after being there. Uh, but anyway, that's why I volunteered uh, over at the uh, Customs House in New Orleans. Everyone were all draftees and I was the only one who had volunteered. So anyway, uh, my first duty station was in Millington, Tennessee, which is around 20 miles north of uh, Memphis. Anyway, uh, it was a Quonset Hut hospital. The only place that was AC was the OR. Every morning, we'd have to kill crickets in the, e in the uh, OR, anyway, uh, before we started operating. We were operating, you know, 12 hours a day, five days a week. Uh, the hospital, it was 500 beds. Usually we were running between 5.30 to 5.50, you know, uh, people. We were seeing people from Vietnam within three to five days of field injuries. So anyway, it was amazing that we were able to get people back to the United States. We had two hospital ships, the Sanctuary and the Repose over there. Uh, anyway, with the uh, terminology in the Navy, a chit would be a piece of paper. Over there I have a chit that says that I had a three-day pass from August 16th through the 19th of 1969. This was the same time as, you know, Woodstock up in New York. Uh, anyway, it was amazing to me that uh, Jerry Fisher, who used to war have the dock of the bay, he was at Woods, uh, he was at Woodstock singing, and I was here with, uh, you know, uh, Camille. Anyway, uh, with the as far as with terminology, the restroom is called a head. Anyway, a Mustang. A Mustang, uh, he was an individual who was enlisted and became an officer. And with saluting, anyway, uh, if they did not salute me, I would salute them. So anyway, that was the easiest way. It's kind of like in Waveland riding my bike. I wave to people. If they wave back, I knew that they from local. If they don't wave, they were either from out of town or they're stuck up. So... <laughs> But anyway, uh, after I went, uh, after I, I had four uh, females in my class in medical school. I graduated in 1971. Anyway, uh, my president of my freshman class, Bruce, became Becky. So anyway, with gender identification, now we have five girls. Uh, uh, you know, Becky is an invasive cardiologist over in Arizona, and anyway, he, he or she is a very smart individual. Uh, but I don't know how his son works up in Hattiesburg. I don't know how you can say that you have two mothers. But anyway, uh, with uh, I did my internship over in Mobile, Alabama at Mobile General. Mobile General had been there for 120 years. Anyway, uh, I got one certification from uh, Mobile General. I got one from USA, which I had never even heard of. They had just selected the dean for the medical school, but anyway, they had not, the medical school had not, uh, uh, had occurred uh, yet. So anyway, uh, when I was do there at Mobile General, we, you know, the CCU, they did not have any. So anyway, uh, thing remote monitoring, that came from the uh, space age as far as with the astronauts. So anyway, with cardiac, cardiac care, anyway, we were able to come up with our cardiac care there at Mobile General in 1971. You know, uh, anyway, uh, when I 
receive my duty. I have just purchased a, a brand new uh, Blazer uh, Chevy truck, $3,200. This was at a time of American pie. I took my Chevy to the levee and the levee was dry. It's good, good old work, work in, as far as the word, or it, going to be, go die. Anyway, at the time of the, uh, the Eve of Destruction, in other words, that was a very popular song at that time. Um, over uh, with the FMF, in other words, you know, uh, I was assigned to the Fleet Marine Force. I did not know that the Navy supplied the medical, uh, medical corps, you know, from the, their doctors. We were, had 18, you know, doctors, you know, uh, there. They flew us over in four different planes, saying that in World War II, a plane that had crashed, how num number of hours of uh, 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 physicians, uh, anyway, they flew us over in four planes to Okinawa. Anytime that you're on a plane for five meals, that's a bad sign as far as I was concerned. But anyway, uh, one of the 18 members, he was an OBGYN. We were supposed to be there at, you know, uh, field medical school for three weeks. Within 72 hours, I was on board going to Okinawa. But anyway, I, I learned very quickly whatever the military tells you, you take with a grain of salt, in other words. Uh, so, but anyway, I was taking care of, you know, uh, after, after 365 days, anyway, all 18 of us came back in one plane. In other words, we were used and abused, uh, you know. Uh, I had... Uh, took care of 3,200 Marines. I had nine deaths. Anyway, I had 27 corpsmen. Many of them were conscientious objectors. So anyway, uh, the first night on call, or in Okinawa, I was called because a black, uh, you know, uh, Marine was on top of the radio tower. Anyway, around 80 feet up. Anyway, I was glad that he came down. Uh, sec second thing that occurred, a shoeshine boy was shot for 25 cents by a M16. I chased after the sergeant who had shot him. Anyway, I was glad that he did not turn around and shoot me, but anyway, uh, we were able to secure him until the MPs arrived. Anything that happens with an international incident Anyway, the individual had to stay there where we found him. When they pulled back the sheets, he was covered with ants. Uh, but anyway, uh, I went to JESCU, Jungle Environmental Survival Training, over in the Philippines. It's amazing to me because being a lieutenant in the Navy, I just noticed just recently that they have me being a lieutenant for the USMC. Uh, but anyway, uh, with JESCU, they took us for a half a day, and then the next three days we had to survive on our own. It's amazing to me that when you're hungry enough, you can catch fish with your bare hands. So anyway, this was quite intriguing as far as how to learn how to survive. They had an entire wall of pictures of uh, pilots who had been shot down. I was 28 years of age in the Gulf of Tonkin, and we were fishing out pilots who had been shot down. I almost went over the hill, which, you know, I got very, very depressed at the time of the Christmas bombings, 11 days in 1972, uh, you know, during Christmas time, 11 days, and I would look at the uh, newspapers and seeing that hospitals were being bombed, uh, you know, there in North Vietnam. Anyway, it was amazing to me that with the you know, brig physicals. I would think that the patients would come to me. I had to go to them. In other words, I would be lowered by a helicopter with a donut. In other words, 
they did not have any safety devices. You just have, have to have the donut underneath your shoulders and you'd be lowered around 50 feet through the helicopter. Anyway, uh, then when the, the uh, Gator Navy, that was what the amphibious uh, branch was called, I was on board the LPH-11, which was the New Orleans. No place better to be than, you know, we were having, you know, a Mardi Gras celebration and then we were called to High Fong for mine sweeping operations. Anyway, uh, with the uh, LPH-11, we had 12 ICU beds, 25 monitor beds, and 750 casualty overflow, you know, areas. I was on board the LP, LSD-35, the Monticello, which was built over in, you know, Pascagoula. Anyway, the captain was a Mustang. He liked his chefs to make use of alcohol as far as in cooking. So anyway, I would get up in the morning and literally run to the galley anyway uh, to uh, eat because the food was excellent. Uh, anyway... Uh, I saw the Marines do many things which I thought was impossible. Uh, anyway, when I came back from overseas, initially I was stationed, uh, supposed to be stationed at the at, Mil at um, Meridian at the Naval Air Station, but I said that if anything is available at Gulfport. So anyway, I was transferred from overseas um, to Gulfport. Anyway, uh, with the Shambies, I worked there. The motto of the CBs is can do. So anyway, you have to check your uh, DO, DO uh, 214. It was 40 years before I noticed that they had the wrong birth date for myself. So anyway, you have to really look at things very closely. I, you know, I have a, a John Wayne there, which is uh, what you would use to open up your cans. It came out in 1942, 1942, and then it retired in 1982. So anyway, they used to have cigarettes. The toilet paper in the, you know, sea rations, it would not even cover your one finger. Anyway, uh, with segregation, anyway, when I went to medical school, the only good thing I can say about segregation was that at the medical school in Jackson, they had adequate number of restrooms and uh, water fountains. So anyway, they had four and four. Uh, but anyway, that was the only good thing. I had never seen such a segregation as opposed to officers versus enlisted. In other words, to me, that was crazy as far as you know, a rectum of an admiral and a rectal uh, of an enlisted man, they look the same. <laughs> so, anyway, with uh, in the uh, two-minute uh, uh, water shower, in other words, on board ship, anyway, uh, with the uh, typhoons in the Gulf of Tonkin, we would... Uh, all ships had to remain on current station. Anyway, sometimes I'd be walking, and the next thing you do, you're walking on the wall, because we take 30 to 45 degree rolls. Uh, so anyway, uh, with, with martial, uh, uh, martial law had been declared in the Philippines, anyway, after dark, the only person would pre present to the ER would be dead on arrival. Anyway, with the taxi cab drivers, my corpsmen, you know, uh, would have sheets that they would put on wires and it would be like ghost. Anyway, the Philippine uh, driver, uh, taxi cab drivers, I'd have to walk five miles from Subic Bay Hospital to the Mao camp because of, uh, you know, the Taxi cab drivers not want to uh, drive. We would take care of uh, malaria. We had lots of rabies shots from dogs and from uh, monkeys uh, and apes. When you are presented with 250 men 
wanting to have their mascot dog, you know, taken care of for a broken, uh, you know, bone. I could take care of bloke and bones for, you know, uh, dogs. Anyway, uh, at the Kui Army Hospital in, you know, Okinawa, I spent two months with, uh, as far as on orthopedics, and we'd go to the leprosorium there. Anyway, with, you know, people would come there saying that, Doc, as far as my eyes are turning orange, and I'd say, you've been to pinkies. Anyway, how did you know, Doc? Because I've taken care of 75 individuals from hepatitis, from pinkies, uh, tattoo parlor. With wet, uh, with seasickness, a lot of times you would not see people for two or three days when we would be in turbulent seas. In the combat zone, you would get paid $75 uh, on paycheck for being in a combat zone, but the nice thing was that the mail was free. In other words, you did not have to use any stamps. You'd be in a red light, you know, a red light in the combat zone. Okay, let me uh, take just a little bit of time for the uh, emergency medicine. It grew out of necessity. We did not do a biopsy of their wallops. We took care of everything. The emergency, uh, it was a 23rd specialty. Anyway, uh, when I came here to Hancock, the ENT residence, Buddy Dotson, you know, was there in his residency and he had all the ENT doctors taking care for 12 hours a day. We treated patients as though that no one else wanted to. So anyway, we were mavericks or cowboys. We were doing things, you know, uh, I'll go set in colos anyway, ER versus ED. Anyway, uh, for the long number of years, we tried to get it to tell us that it was an emergency department. With Bob Dole, he came out with that commercial for erectile dysfunction. So anyway, at that time, it was the thing that ER was on television. So anyway, that we resorted saying, hey, we're ER physicians. Uh, <laughs> so, but anyway, Bob Dole just, you know, the ED. Uh, anyway, in, in by, we found, you know, things that we had with uh, as far as on the battlefields, both foreign and urban. The uh, first residency was in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1970. I was called a grandfather of emergency medicine here in our state. Uh, we worked hard and we got real time off. In other words, we would have sometimes Vibrio, in other words, Vibrio infections. This was very, very common. In other words, people would die from a Vibrio infection within, you know, uh, six to eight hours of a, initial uh, contact with the Vibrio uh, bacteria. So anyway, thank you all very much for letting me speak. Uh, anyway, on there, I was a trusty shellback as opposed to a slimy polywog. So on that cross the equator, anyway, the, they have, because of hazing, it is now elective whether or not when you cross the equator on a Navy ship, it's elective whether or not you go through the uh, ceremony with Davy Jones and, you know, King Neptune. But anyway, uh, I have some of the things that are up here. Uh, anyway, one of the books, it was a pirate edition. In other words, overseas, they did not have uh, copyright laws and you know people that would it would cost almost uh, several hundred dollars for textbooks and you could get, get them for pennies overseas uh, you know because of non copyright thank you all very much for your attention thank you Doc, a few years ago, had a stroke.
Express of aphasia. John, John Fetterman had took, took a, I, I, for 66 years I had a, a hole in my heart which I had never known. I played basketball at Stancilos. I was able uh, to run three miles without any problems, but anyway, it, it, six, six, 66 years it took for the find a, find a expressive aphasia. So. <laughs>